What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I have the pleasure of having New Market Wizards uh, trader Victor Sperandi on the podcast. And uh, yeah, I, I invited Victor after, you know, uh, getting to know his background extensively. I, I've had Jack Schwager on the podcast, and recently I've been doing um, uh, some reading on some more in-depth reading on on the individual market wizards, and, you know, I've been trying to reach out to them as well. And Victor's one of them. And uh, so what better than to have one of the market wizards on the podcast? So Victor, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, David. Yeah. So Victor, or uh, you go by also by Trader Vic. Is that correct? That was your... Well, Barron's nicknamed me that in that article in 87 that you related to. And it sticks with me. So most people know that. I've used that uh, effectively as a sort of marketing nickname where people remember that. But when you say the word Sporandio, which is my last name, people don't know who the hell that is, but they know Trader Vic. So uh, you can, you know, you can call me that if you wish. It doesn't matter to me. Gotcha. All right. So, so Trader Vic or Victor. So how, so you want to give a, a background on how you got started trading. I know some of it from the, of course, the market witches and all that, but just um, from I want to get your take on on your own background, how how you got started. Okay, well, I started in the in the uh, in Wall Street in '66, January, and at a menial job called a quote boy. Then went on to be an options trader in the old OTC options business with Filer Schmidt in '68. And then started my own options firm in 71. We became the biggest options dealer in the world in six months because of making firm markets. And then we joined the CBOE. Uh, also started to trade futures because they were in, inflationary hot in those days. So derivatives is my background. Okay. Then I got on to, you know, just trading outright and ran George Soros's money in 81 successfully and became really just a, a market trader, didn't use the options uh, knowledge I had. And although we were innovators, didn't use it as much. I just became a, a market trader as such. I'd use options, but I didn't develop any fancy methods of just exclusively trading options. So fast forward into the uh, 1990s, uh, I basically uh, started to develop algorithmic trading uh, where I create these methods of putting together portfolios to have them trade for me as I was getting a little older and it's harder to sit in front of a machine. You're a young guy, you can focus all day. The problem is when you sit for eight hours in front of a machine and you have to focus, which is a great business when you're young, but you tend to have a limited uh, attention span as you get older. So I started to create these algorithmic trading methods, which were very successful, got them branded by S&P in some cases, created many methodologies that were used in the billions, three three plus billion in two different uh, uh, systematic trading mechanisms I put together. So uh, that's basically my career. I still do that to this day is create portfolios that trade themselves depending on what you want to accomplish. So interesting. So so you started out as a quote boy. And uh, so you, you didn't go to college for this or anything, right? No, not... I... I I went to college at night for four years, took economics mainly in finance and never graduated. But although I had about 104 credits, I needed 128. And I started my business then. And I really didn't believe I needed uh, to, the college degree because I was the president of the company. Gotcha. The reason why I asked is because, OK, so in the, in the 90s, you were creating all these algorithms and systematic trading. And this is like highly sophisticated I'm assuming you need to know a lot of math and a lot of, uh, you know, when I think of algorithms, I think of the other market wizard on what's his name, um, uh, the math guy, the guy that defeated the uh, the casinos, uh, Ed Thorpe. So like you right. know, um, 
are were you doing algorithms on that level of like calculus yeah. and math? Oh yeah, no, we we had billions in in this process, but the key to this was really experience. And experience, what I mean, experience, the knowledge I have in trading all things, um, it, it allowed me to put together portfolios that would offset each other within the portfolio so that, you know, you protected yourself when markets were, were very violent uh, and you didn't have to worry about being, you know, crash and burning, if you will. So that was more experience. See, if you hire a PhD in there, you're generally the smartest of the the academics. The problem is they don't have any experience. So they, they will look at things today and they will see how they work, but they will not understand how they will work in all circumstances. So they usually create things that fail. But if you have a lot of experience, and I'm a researcher, so I my research goes back to the 1800s. So that, in combination with experience, allowed me to create mechanisms where when you put them all together, you get very robust results. Sort of like if you think about uh, Bridgewater. You know, Bridgewater is a, is a par excellence firm. I kind of do what they do. Uh, they they got there first and you know or became extremely successful in their in their uh, marketing of their concepts. I'm not a great marketer, but I I did have you know I did succeed, but not to the extent of Bridgewater. But it was my my concepts. They have the thing called the All Weather Fund, and that All Weather Fund I took a completely different dimension. I would say that my process is far superior. I can explain why, but I'm not going to get into that. But the, the point is, I know more than he did because I traded more things. So I could implement where he would use an ETF, say, for agriculture. And I would use long, short trading strategies, which are far more efficient and far less beta-driven so I, when when he, when the commodities fell, for example, he would lose, I would make. So now, I mean, not taking anything away from uh, Bridgewater, they're the, the best. But the point I'm getting at is having knowledge here through experience was key, not necessarily having mathematical ability, although I do, I am a numbers guy, but I wouldn't tribute any success I've had to these strategies based on on math alone. It was knowing how to put products together that would offset each other and have low vol and robust returns. Awesome. Wow, great explanation right there. So um, you mentioned about uh, researching, your interest in researching and history. So were you looking like, for example, before the, the 1987 crash, I haven't read that article on Barron's. I just know it was mentioned in multiple things that I, I was looking up on you. And uh, it was referenced quite a bit. And uh, so with that, uh, were you looking at history like the previous crashes, uh, 1929, Tulip Mania, and then later on in the future, you know, we get the dot-com bubble, the multiple crashes. So are you constantly referencing other points throughout history, like, you know, with extreme uh, panic or bubble situations? Yes. It, 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 let me, I'll just refer to this. There's basically three principal uh, concepts you need in order to be successful. You need the technical, which is where I started in the 60s, being a, a tape trader and then a technician. But you also need to understand the fundamentals. Now, I've always been a macro guy, uh, an economist, if you will, but I don't have the degree that basically allowed you to do the big picture and then use the technical analysis in between, integrating the two. And then you need the mastery of yourself so you have uh, you have emotional discipline. In other words, the psychological end of the business, which is really important. And I've taught traders. I had a firm and 
I taught 47 traders, gave them my capital, five succeeded, and the rest failed. Why? I taught them the same thing. The bottom line is people can't execute their knowledge. They're emotionally driven most of the time. So uh, it's 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 a it's a complex. That's why trading is so difficult. Plus, I'll add this in from two oh eight. The markets have changed dramatically because the laws have changed. Dodd Frank, for example, changed many things in Wall Street. But the, you have to take into account that things are evolving in trading. For example, I used to be renowned as a day trader and i was and then this uh, the uh, s p futures began i got into that i mastered that then goldman and 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 uh, morgan stanley came in and started to do these buy programs so you had to adjust for that it, it, it's always innovation and adjusting to the laws of the game that change the rules so it's a very difficult business. Uh, let's just put it that way. Wow. Okay. So you mentioned you had a uh, forty-seven traders under your wing, and you gave them capital, and five of them succeeded. And Thir uh, thirty-nine. 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 Okay. And uh, so, so it's about emotional discipline. So, what do you yeah. think is is uh, like some traders have it, some traders don't, and very you know, and can this be worked on? Like, what's your take on that? it's very difficult. I know that Richard Dennis was a guy like me and he had trained these people. He called them the turtles, but he was very eclectic in picking these people to trade. I wasn't, I picked anybody. I said, well, I'm going to teach you. So I don't care what you know or what you don't know. His method was better than mine. Okay. He, he chose, for whatever reasons, and I don't know exactly all of them, but, you know, a lot of it had to do with how smart they were. The The point is that I believe that you can train anybody, and, and, and that was correct in the sense you can give them the knowledge, but you can't give them that, what I called in my books, emotional discipline, the ability to execute your knowledge, because people don't like taking losses. Or they're afraid if they take a loss, they'll get whipsawed and then they'll look stupid. So it, it, it's a very emotional business in many respects. I never had that issue. I was always rules based. I basically had a very robust trading career where I made money most of the time, almost all the time. The, the point is that losses never bothered me. I would, if I bought something, I always had a reason. If that reason didn't work out, it went the other way, I was gone. So I took a lot of short-term losses, small losses, and really didn't have any big big losses. I had a, a one quarter loss in about 20 years, which occurred in a half hour. <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't like I let my losses run. It was a one of these buy programs. I was short S and P's, and all of a sudden Morgan Stanley came in and did this huge buy program. And I was, you know, by the time I wanted to get out, it was against me. So that that mounted to a a, a loss for the quarter. And in this case, I was trading for interstate securities and it was a 50-50 deal. So they put up the money. If I won, I got 50 cents. If I lost, I gave them 50 cents. So that was the only loss I had in about 20 years because I had to give them that, that one loss on that trade. But the, the point is, most people have problems taking losses and executing a plan and they have egos where they don't want to take that loss because they believe it's a reflection on them. So the ego. So, so you, so those, for example, those traders that you, uh, that you had under your wing, those 39, um, the ones that succeeded, did they just have less of an ego a lot? Was that, what was like a main common denominator that you think? Was it ego? Was it emotional? Was it because they all had the right tutelage? They all had the right, you, 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 this right format that yeah. you taught them. So it, what do you think was the common denominator? The common denominator was the ability to take losses as I taught them. 
And they made the five made more than the 34 that lost. Yeah. But it wasn't a great business. It wasn't, you know, a McDonald. I used to call them the McDonald's because I thought I was going to have like a franchise, you know, where I just teach people. Uh, they get a franchise, you know, I give them capital. But it didn't work out that way because more lost than won because they couldn't execute the discipline to sell or cover a short uh, quickly. They basically let their losses run. Now, as far as Richard Dennis was the the guy that taught the turtle traders, right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 So with him, was it more systematic? Was it more like robotic? And that's why like he was able, or was it the, the selection of traders? I remember, I think he, he chose like chess players or certain criteria. Right. What yes. do you think it was? Yeah, it was, it was that. And also he taught a system. I didn't teach a system. I basically taught a strategy of using different tools to accomplish your goals. So like I said, I integrate fundamentals, technicals, the psychology section it was automatic for somebody like me. But the, the point is you have to integrate fundamentals with technicals if you're what's called a discretionary trader. Dennis taught people a strategy, a, a systematic strategy. It was long-term to buy breakouts and they executed that strategy. Well, they, they, they were, many of those traders were winners. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I, I don't know if you know, but I interviewed Jack Schwager and I asked him about the market wizards were they mostly discretionary or systematic. And he, you know, he said, of course, they're, uh, all of them except Ed Sakota, I think was, were discretionary. And he said, discretionary traders are, I'm looking. He's he, Jack Schwager said he's he's looking for dramatic performances and and usually the discretionary traders, uh, the ones in the market wizards, they have like that dramatic performance. With like systematic, you can get it's more reliable and uh, a way to learn to get profitable. But for dramatic performance, is discretionary. Now my question is like for you, were you aiming towards like for that? okay, like those five can have dramatic performance rather than just like consistent, profitable traders? Or... Yeah, yeah. the answer is yes. And, and re remember, I, I stress this. I started to get into systematic trading in the late 90s, 1999 to be exact, when I was getting older and I found it very difficult to focus. You know, like I, my mind would wander a little bit about looking at the machine and, you know, that's why I developed those processes so I wouldn't have to make discretionary decisions. They were automatic. And the things I created worked, worked well. But, but again, when the, when the government changes the rules, what you're doing has to change because you're, you're developing rules based on certain aspects of of the law, whether you know it or not. And when they change, you have to readjust. So, I mean, I still use these methods. They're still valid, but you have to understand when to use them and when to, let's say, adjust the leverage. Because again, what I do, I could trade a hundred million dollars with three million dollars there's only three percent margin because of the nature of the way i put together these portfolios they're very low vol gotcha so okay so i have a question so you okay so you started like uh in the 60s 70s and back then the, the computer wasn't prevalent that were you trading at all with computers but when did you start in, implementing the computer was it the late 90s or like the, when was the early the early 80s the early 80s so uh, like what percentage of traders were actually using a computer back then? Uh, very few. Uh, although there were CTAs that use systematic strategies that go back to the seventies. But the bottom line is when you say computers, you know, computer trading per se, algorithmic trading was really started to come into so because the computers started to get very beefed up in the early eighties that that's when they started to be able to do what they do today where gotcha. you can touch a lot large amount of objects and they'll basically once you program them they'll they'll spit out what you tell it to do 
Gotcha. And uh, so, so what's your background with with George Soros? When did you start to get involved with? Uh, okay, so you started with options, uh, ETFs, and then um, how'd you get into forex? I'm pretty sure George Soros Soros is is uh foreign exchange, right? Well, he was, but he was everything, and the quantum fund traded everything discretionary. And what happened was uh, I was very well known for the short side of the markets in the 60s, 70s and early 80s. I was known for that because I was looking for it much different than the markets of today. When I started in 66, for example, the Dow Jones uh, industrials, which were the key uh, average at the time, uh, unlike S&P today and from 66 to 74, the Dow went down five years and up four years. So you could see the lo the longs and shorts were very balanced. Today, I mean, the really the last recession we've had was 208, 208, 29. And you had that decline due to COVID in March of 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 uh of 220 which lasted two months i mean the national bureau of economic research which rates these things they rated it a recession for two months the last one was ended in april of 09 so you could see that the the government has changed its tune they manipulate the economy to a huge degree they always did to some degree but it was never egregious but in starting with Obama, it started to get egregious. So we haven't had a recession since really 2009. I don't count the two months uh, of the of COVID uh, decline as a recession. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, even though there was a huge decline, it didn't, wasn't a recession in my world. And I've studied these back to the 1850s where they started to rate recoveries and recessions so the bottom line is you 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 know right now you're in a an atmosphere where the the government doesn't want the markets to go down except when they get this inflationary issue and they try to do that in sophisticated ways where they raise rates but as you notice the stock market is not affected by raising rates they're affected by money supply growth now if you look up M2, it's declined, but they've got this thing called reverse repos. There's a trillion seven in there that was two trillion two. And that money can go into the market in a moment's notice. So it's not like the depressionary levels of the of the 20s where where money supply declined. Uh, 28, I think 30 was the last one. But the bottom line is, is that the, you, you, you have a different way of playing the game because the government is forcing you to play that different game. So you have to be up on the times. That's why I say it takes now political knowledge, fundamental knowledge, and economic knowledge, as well as, of course, monetary knowledge, because most of the Fed is driven with monetary theory or not. But the bottom line is that the game is very much changed from when I started to be a successful trader. Gotcha. So you mentioned uh, that COVID crash. Yeah, it's definitely not a recession. It's just happened so fast. Um, now, um, do you think technology has something to do with that? Everybody now having access, me, like, for example, just me right here. This is not possible like 15 years ago. Me, just a, a regular guy. Uh, with all this, all this uh, data in front of me, information, uh, tape, and level two coming at me from all different angles, um, and everybody trading on their phone at the time with Robinhood, and they're giving money to trade, and they're trading from E Trade, from all these retail brokerages that anybody Uber driver has access to, the teacher at school has access to, uh, the tutor. I was a tutor before I started trading around that time. So, like, do you think? Everybody having access made made this uh this technology makes things faster with the internet and if, you know the the answer is in part yes a heavy yes but the main emphasis I believe 
of what's moving markets today and makes them act the way they do is that people have learned a great deal of the game and they act in a similar fashion. Like the, for example, in 1971, uh, and this is a true story. I try to relate it. I was trading and I heard this concept called fed funds. I said, what, what is fed funds? Everybody's talking, you know, the few guys I know there were, it wasn't, it wasn't in print. And I started to ask around on what fed funds were Not one of my professional friends, and they was very sophisticated, knew what fed funds were today. It's it's on the TV at night. <laughs> everybody knows what Fed funds are. So if the Fed makes a move, everybody is following the Fed. So they've been they've been learned into if the Fed is doing this or that, it's going to have an effect. So a lot of it has to do with with the people learning the game of the current game where the Fed is is sort of king. Gotcha. And um, going back to Forex. So when you worked at the quantum fund, so like what, what, what made you, what made you, how'd you get started with that? With George well, Soros? Well, okay. I had this reputation of being a great bear trader. And in those days, again, markets went up and they went down pretty much equally. And Soros had a very bad year in 1981. He lost 33% for the quantum fund. So he was bright enough, and he's one of the smartest men I've ever met, IQ-wise. The guy was is, is 10 of most people you know. So he, he said, well, his fees were 1 in 15 for the quant fund. So he hired me to just trade the short side. He gave out the money. In other words, he became a fund of funds. He gave out money to long players. He knew I was a short player. So I was the hedge against the long money and got a huge amount of quantum funds money to hedge. It was all stocks in those days, by the way. And he, we basically picked the portfolio together of what I could short. There were 50 stocks. And uh, it was uh, successful. In other words, I did hedge uh, his position. It was a very challenging deal. The deal basically was I get the 15% of the profits. He kept the 1% fee, which is fine. Uh, if I lost 5%, I was fired. Now, the Dow was was uh, like 800. So a 40-point move in the Dow, I was gone. So I never I ran the money for seven months. The other part of the deal was if I ever got bullish, I would stop trading and give them the money back, which is what happened. I picked the bottom in August by knowing in July of 82 that the market was making a low. So I stopped trading the short side successfully, gave me a check. Then I said, well, give me a small amount of long money. He wouldn't do it because he had too many long players. See, so that was the end of my routine with him. But he said I was very professional and, you know, he's a businessman all the way. He's not a friend. So, you know, we shook hands and that was that. So, so once you, you stopped seeing the bear market play out, you just gave the money back and that was the end of it. That was the end of it. <laughs> I stopped. It. So that was the part of the, that was the, the deal. The deal was I had to be, well, I didn't add this in. I had to be a hundred percent short. Or flat, I couldn't have I couldn't have part of the position. He was looking for a hedge against his longs, and his longs were run by other people, not him. So wow. I, I I spoke to him every day for seven months on the phone. Sundays, holidays didn't matter. But the bottom line was, so I I managed to avoid losing the five percent. And made some money. Didn't make a huge amount of money, but I hedged the positions and I won under a very challenging deal because, again, you could 40 points in the Dow, even at that time, was, you know, could happen within a day. Wow. 
So I was um I was watching another podcast that I like. It's called the PVD podcast. I don't know if you're familiar. It's this guy, Patrick Bed David, a very successful entrepreneur. And he was um showing a clip of George Soros saying, like back in the a long time ago, it must have been the 90s or early 2000s, where he was saying like he feels like he's God. And uh so like I was always wondering, like, does it take that kind of personality? Because you know, with trading, we're 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 not supposed to be egotistic, like we just went over and um not supposed to be like emotional or something but like Soros had this vision apparently from that interview and a couple other interviews where he felt like he has like he's overseeing everything I don't know so you being able to deal with him for for eight months in a row or whatever it was like yeah. do, what do you think was the quality that he had that made him so successful like massively successful you know well well although I don't agree with George's politics so let me just say that but he was he he's by far the most brilliant man that i ever knew let's put it that way so he related himself as god because he he kept winning and he had this uncanny ability to dope things out correctly now he was more a fundamental trader in currencies than he was anything else but he he basically was right so often that you know he he used that expression although he really didn't believe he was a god he was using it as a a reference to his being right and and he was and he he understood that i was very impressed with his technical knowledge because he was a fundamental currency guy. He basically was an economist. <clears throat> so uh, I was impressed that he even knew some of the basics about technical trading, which he would talk to me off the cuff. And, you know, he, he, he had a tremendous amount of knowledge. He, he In politics, he's smarter than any 10, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, take 10 men in the Senate and the House of Representatives he's smarter than all of them put together. So he's a brilliant man. He's recognized this. Why? Through reinforcement, because he kept being right. And he developed a, let's call it a, a healthy uh, emotional uh, self-esteem because he never let his trading to my knowledge, get the best of him. Yes, he did lose 33% in 81. Why, I don't know. Because he came to me after that. But all I can say is he believed in himself to such a degree because of his successes. So occasionally he used that expression, God, he really uh, didn't believe that. But he is a nihilist. You know, in other words, he... He he's uh, he believes that after he dies, that's it. You know, the world ends. So he's not sympathetic to, for example, capitalism, where he's more he's more challenging himself to take down the Constitution. I mean, that's kind of the way he's his goal. His mind works, you know, because if it's hard and difficult that's what he wants to do but understand a man that can accumulate 25 billion plus dollars in trading there, there's a few others that have done that but but very few he's he's a very successful guy and his main source of success for your people and yourself is is the difference was that when he believed he was right he bet very big so you'll hear, I'm I'm somewhat critical when I say this, these guys who do videos and they manage money and, you know, they'll buy this and then they'll sell that and they'll probably nibble at things, you know, that that's not money management. That's you're you're staying in the game to collect fees. That's really what you're doing. But he when he believed in something, he took huge bets. So he fees bear on the British pound, for example, which is a famous trade he made. He would bet huge. He would bet very big. But he also knew when to take his losses. See, so he'd get out of a trade 
So he, he's not one of these guys that I was referring to, the people who worked for me, who didn't want to take a loss. He was very good at, at losing money as well as making money. But the difference between him and, and, and most other people is the size of his bets. That's the difference. So, so concentrated, concentrated bets, the concept of concentrated bets. So, uh, I, you know, I've heard this from, um, actually from a tweet from Mark Cohodes, uh, that concentrated bets will make you rich. So like, um, was that something that came, like that you were, that came, like you were also on board with early on, or what about even those 39 traders or the five that succeeded was, how was it, uh, for the, just people in general that learn from you, how is it? For them to understand that concept of going bigger when you have the most confidence. No, I, I never promoted that concept per se. Uh, I've used it occasionally, but much less than when Soros used it. In other words, he he saw things and he took big bets much more often than I would have. But when I took when I when I see things that I think are going my way. I'll go 40 to one le or I'll go 10 to one leverage, use that expression. So I, I in, in other words, I'll, I'll bet 10 times my, my capital. So, you know, th this is in futures, you could do this in options, you could do it, but I don't do it often. I do it very, very uh, uh, occasionally. And I always have an out and the out is religious. So if 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 I say I'm going to do this and I'm using huge amounts of leverage or not even, but especially if 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 it hits the level that I'm not it's not supposed to hit, I'm gone. I'm out immediately. So because you're playing with, you know, with uh, life changing money. So Soros would have the ability to to win more than lose doing that. And um, so. Is this like oh like okay so you've only had like one outlier loss from what I understand uh, in your whole career or you know so how are you able to just implement that in, like from the get go pretty much uh, has well, it, was it always like that? It's knowing when you do a trade, when are you wrong? If you can answer that question, you buy a stock at fifty, you say I'm wrong at forty nine. If it hits 49, no questions, you sell it. Those are the successful guys. This is, the problem is, is when it hits 49, people say, well, I'll, I'll, I think it's going up. I'm going to double down. You see, or <laughs> they'll change their their plan. And you see, that's that's you're, you're not sticking by a well thought out strategy and you'll more likely use emotions to be the judge when you buy and sell and therefore you will wind up most people will wind up losing gotcha so so you mentioned about soros uh once once uh you decided it's not a, a bear market anymore he just gave gave the money back now how difficult was it for you because like if you know that's the end uh maybe you want to just convince yourself that it's still bear market because if not you got you know the the you yeah, but Over. that's not the way you, you you know really you you've got to be honest and you're you're dealing with your reputation right so what's important for me is being a professional <clears throat> and basically if i'm a bull i'm a bull if i'm a bear i'm a bear if not i i'll say the difference it's not about holding on to assets gotcha and um so you how how much of it do you think of like your discipline for trading is it deal is it, you you got to deal with it with your life all around like for example just like your the way you cut your losses uh for trading like you know you your discipline in other areas of your life like it's just a lifestyle well you know aristotle said that excess is not good the, you know the the golden mean is what he called it you know the be live an average sort of life when it comes to eating or drinking or whatever you're doing is to be moderate. I mean, I've lived kind of by that, those rules.
Gotcha. And um, how did you decide to? Were you just a bear in general? Because okay, so you had you 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 uh mm -hmm. predicted the market crash in bearings, and you know you worked with, with Soros as a bear. So like, how much of of your trading was always just uh, on the bear side? After eighty two, very little because the game had changed, and the the government. Uh, here's a, just an example. The government changed where we were printing money in the 70s uh, to attain growth. And it led to high inflation, which came in with Volcker doing similar things to what Jay Powell is doing now. Well, when Reagan won and James Baker III, who was a bright, very bright, he was, he's done a few things for Reagan, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State, and they switched their policies. So they went from printing money to create growth to borrowing money. And James Baker espoused that, believe it or not, on Meet the Press in June of 1982. I happened to be watching that show that put millions of dollars in my pocket because I knew what they were going to do was not print, but borrow. And, you know, when you start out borrowing, we had very low debt in those years. They were wiped out by inflation. So you basically had a theme that carried forward to this day where borrowing was the theme, not, not necessarily printing, although they print today. And that's what caused the uh, inflation you just saw because of what they did with locking down the country, meaning the governors and mayors idiotically closed business. So you, you would, you would have had a full blown depression. You were on the road to that. And then the fed came in and threw in $5 trillion or so and printed the money and, you, you you have to understand, see, that's why I say you can't just be a technician, a technical trader, because there's a lot of subtleties that basically surround the fundamentals. You have to put the two of them together. And of course, as I said, I'm repeating, you have to understand your emotions and execute a plan. So if you have a loss and you say, I'm going to sell if it reaches this level, you have to execute that. But today, I would say that aside from from technicals and fundamentals, you have to understand the politics of, of what's going on in the world, because the politics lead what the Fed does. And so if you understand the politics, you will be a lot richer. So you have to get into that if you're not into it. Gotcha. And so... Were you were you always interested in the overall picture? Okay, like fundamentals, politics, technicals. Um, you know, just like you mentioned George Soros, he was interested in Forex. A lot of people understand like Forex or currencies as just technicals. And but like there's more to it. There's more pieces of the puzzle that you gotta constantly put together. And you know, so when did you become interested in this like you know, formulating this this big picture in your head and coming, I well, guess, with, well, with a thesis. Remember, I was a macro economist. So I would, I'm not a micro guy. I couldn't pick a NVIDIA for you, except if it was off a chart. But my theme is the macro because most stocks react to the macro. So I was never a micro trader. So I wouldn't have been able to pick Microsoft or or uh, Amazon. See, that wasn't my strength. I was a market trader that used macroeconomics to determine what I was going to do, along with my knowledge of derivatives, so that I could implement derivatives. And, and basically, I had the emotional discipline to execute my plans without me getting, you know, burned to the cleanest. See, Soros was a fundamental understander of currencies, what made them go up and down, which was economic policies of the countries he was trading the currencies in. He, 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 he understood technical analysis 
to a degree. All right. He was he was very good, actually, as I said, surprised me. But the bottom line is he was basically a fundamental macro currency trade trader. Wow. So on that level of uh, are who's the competition in in that case? Is it the banks? Is it is it like countries like uh, because like, for example, with me as a regular trader, retail trader, I'm competing against other retail traders. Now, when you're that big, or you're thinking about the macro. Who becomes your competition? Do you see it that way at all? Like almost like a like a chess no, game? I never saw it that way. No, nobody. In other words, it's a big market. There's lots of things to trade. And you can pick and choose what you want. I didn't look at it that what I was doing was similar to what other people were doing. Gotcha. And um, so uh, to start to wrap it up, so I wanted to know your history, like with Jack Schwager. How did you get in contact? What's the story behind that? Like, how did he? Well, I had a great reputation. He found me. Jack is a good man. He wrote great books. I appreciate being in one of those books. And he found me and came out and interviewed me. And I was hot in those days. So I was worthy of, at the time. I don't think I'd be worthy today because I'm not that active today. But the but the point is, um, uh, he found me and he's I have nothing but praise for him. Gotcha. And um, did you get in contact with any of the other market wizards uh, and co collaborate, for example, or any... Anything like that? Well, no, but I know some of them. I mean, I know, you know, uh, I, 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 I know some of them and met some of them, but I don't. We don't nece necessarily keep in contact. We did at one time, uh, but but not at this, not recently. Awesome. So, well, Victor, it's been great. Um... Doing the podcast with you, Trader Vic. Wow, legendary trader. And um, I'll have your books in the show notes. Is there any other last thoughts you want to let the audience know? No, except that these are very difficult markets. And I would never believe anything the Fed says, although I wouldn't oppose what they're saying. In other words, if Al says he's going to raise rates, assume he's going to raise rates. But I don't believe the reasons or the, you know, they, they're setting you up to lie to you to accomplish their goals. So you have to be just aware that many people, you know, I, I see on podcasts and stuff, they believe what the Fed says and they just make it up, you know, to accomplish their goals. So you have to and you have to learn the game. It's different. You have to learn what's going on and. I mean, the, the policies of, of uh, Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed are Keynesian. And they will never be right if they only believe in Keynesian economics. They're going to be wrong a lot more than they're right. So you have to be critical and skeptical of what they say. But I wouldn't go against them, if you know what I mean. In other words, if he says he's going to raise rates, I believe that. And you have to take that into account because he he will to, until he doesn't. OK, but, but the point is they they don't tell you the truth and they don't understand basic economics to make things happen according to what they want. They they basically have an agenda. And that agenda is 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 uh is unknown actually why they are doing what they're doing is unknown to me. And here's two examples. You talk about the wealth effect. So you want stocks down, you raise rates. They have an increased margin requirement since 1974 margin requirement. They, they allow you to buy stock on margin, 50% margin. Why don't you raise margin requirements? Raising, Interest rates, as Milton Friedman expounded many times, that is not monetary policy. Monetary policy is keeping money supply stable. That's going to cu curb inflation. If Milton Friedman were alive today, he'd be advising to raise, allow money supply growth at 5% for three years. That's what we're going to do. He wouldn't be raising rates 11 times 
because you're you're punishing the small businesses. I mean, Google doesn't need money. It doesn't borrow money except to buy back stock. <clears throat> and it does that if it feels like. The point is that's why you have a few companies that are doing exceptionally well and many that are not is because rising interest rates hurt small businesses far more than big businesses that don't need the cash. So you have to examine all of these things to yourself and dope it out. And there's no way I can expound this to you in this short period. But I can only tell you that the Fed is doesn't know what they're doing and or they do know what they're doing and they're lying to you for a separate agenda. Absolutely. Well, Victor, excellent. We'll note that and uh, we'll have everything in the show notes for everybody. And once again, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure and we'll keep in contact. Thanks a lot. Okay, David, thank you and good luck to you. Thanks. Bye, Victor.